So welcome, welcome back to the second week of the GGI School of Fundamental Interaction. My name is Fabio Maltoni. I'm one of the organizers. Uh, there is an echo, let's see. Yeah, okay. And uh, together with Julia today, we will be your hosts uh, for the week. Uh, we have two, uh, <laughs> we have two, two lecturers uh, this week, uh, as you know, um, from uh, different sides of theoretical physics. So here, Vali uh, was starting the lecture this morning, and so much time they, they caught uh, this afternoon and talk about uh, uh, flavor physics. So uh, let me introduce you. Uh, there's Junior. Junior, do you want to say a few words? Uh, if you like, or, or we can get oh, go ahead yeah. to producing gear as you like, as you prefer. Uh, no, I just um, we are we are as Fabio said we are our guest we are our host for this section for this week. So whatever we can you can ask us and rely on us this week, and uh, we are organizers on our expertise our flavor physics and for Fabio's QCD so. Uh, we are kind of hosting this section and we are very thankful to the speakers. I would like to thank uh, Dvali and uh, later on um, Sebastian de Cosrenon, which I, so that's, that's all I have to say. You said everything already. Okay. okay. Bye. Very, very Bye. good. Um, so if uh, if you have questions uh, you uh, about the organization of, of this week but it's the same structure as last week so we will uh, have uh, two lectures during the day and then towards the uh, evening we will have the discussion session five to six um so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the the first lecturer uh Giant valley valley is one of the leading figures in uh, uh, beyond the standard model physics, uh, he has worked on a large number of topics and that somewhat uh, cover uh, one or more of the fundamental problems that we have uh, in, uh, in physics, which uh, deal with the gravitation and gravitational interactions, and also the fact that uh, somewhat we have uh, different scales uh, that of which we don't understand very well the origin. So uh, here, uh, graduated in 92 in Georgia. And then after that, he went uh, uh, to several famous institutions around the world. Then he was at CERN and, and New York. Uh, and then finally, he has been since 2010, he has been uh, uh, joining uh, uh, Munich and uh, where he's director of the Max, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute for Physics. Uh, so, uh, Gia, we, you, uh, thank you very much for being here in this uh, not in suboptimal conditions, but we will try to do our best as students and teachers to comply and to, to make this experience the best. Um, so you will be giving your lectures through the uh, tablet, right? That's right, yeah, I, I'm going to write. Yeah. So I'll leave you in the organization of your uh, uh, two hours as you, as you like, there might be a break, so you can interact with students and you can ask them if, if you are allowing them to ask questions in your lectures or in time as, as you wish. You have a full freedom in the next two hours. So, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much um, uh, for the, the invitation. And um, uh, so, my, yeah, I'm, I'm Gia Dwali and uh, I'm going to give some lectures. In, uh, online uh, in online format in uh, what we call beyond the standard model physics and um, so that so there are two hours uh, i'll make a break in between i don't know depending um probably five ten minutes um and during the lecture so I, i'm okay so these are unusual circumstances because of what everybody knows so I'll try to make, okay, my best out of it. And um, so I will write in, in real time. Uh, I will use this uh, virtual blackboard or whiteboard. And um, uh, you can, uh, yes, please, it's encouraged. 
that you, you ask questions whenever you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, and um, um, yeah, just of course, it's this is very important so that the, the lecture is interactive because um, that will give me a feedback. Um, also, whether I'm going too fast, whether I should slow down or discuss few things. And uh, um, so this, the subject of um, beyond the standard model is, is um, of course, it's extremely broad. Essentially, everything beyond the standard model is beyond the standard model, BSM physics. Um, so therefore, uh, if you have some questions that go beyond immediate um, frame of the lecture, uh, that is also okay. You can you can ask me. We, we can improvise. If uh, I'll try my best to answer. If I know the answer. If I don't, I'll tell you that I don't know the answer, and maybe we can think together. Um, okay. So um, yeah, that's more or less it. Um, I don't know. Are there any initial questions? Is there any? Of course, you can. As I said, you can interrupt me anytime. Um, let me. Th therefore, we can start. Let me give um, some introductory uh, remarks. Yes, of course, and also obviously, since beyond the standard model, physics covers many different aspects. Um, uh, it is natural that there may be some 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 overlap with other lectures, with other lectures material. Um, and that's only, that. there's nothing, I mean, that's perfect. Uh, there's no problem. It's always good to, to have a look at the same topic from different perspectives. Um, the, the lectures, they never, they're never copies of each other. Um, they're always, there is some personal view. And uh, okay, so that's not a problem. All right, so let me, start with um, some remarks. Now, BSM physics, uh, this is. BSM physics, um, okay, let's call it a lecture, lecture one. Um, it's basically beyond the standard model. And um, um, it's from the perspective of what do we call fundamental physics. Um, and fundamental physics is about uh, trying to understand um, most elementary building blocks of nature and also to understand those building blocks at different length scales. Okay. Um, so, therefore, the tool that I'm a particle physicist, so the tool that we use for understanding these building blocks of nature uh, is. Elementary particle physics, or quantum field theory, elementary particle physics. Okay. Now the um, there are many different length scales of nature. I, I we can draw a uh, very schematically. We can draw some um, this line about length scales. Let me call it L. And uh, okay, let's say here is we have zero somewhere. And uh, there are many different length scales, of course, that we encounter in physics. Um, for example, there is a largest observable length scale that we have. This is uh, Hubble length, present Hubble length. Let me denote it by LH. It's approximately 10 to the 28 centimeters, if we measure it in centimeters. Um, yeah, of course, most of the time I'm going to use units, particle physicists units, um, H bar and speed of light one. Okay, um, but sometimes I may restore H bar when, when, when needed. Um, so this is the largest observable length scale that we have, but of course we have I mean, we have no reason to, to believe that nature just terminates there. Um, there are most likely length scales that, that are way larger. Um, and then there is a length scale, which however, um, we can call uh, the Planck length. Um, and um, 
which is uh, the most likely is the shortest um, length scale. And it is an extremely important length scale of nature. Uh, it is also a, a scale of uh, quantum gravity. So the Planck length is, you can define Planck length as uh, the square of the Planck length in those units is just simply Newton's constant. Okay, so Newton's constant has dimensionality of the uh, length square. But if you restore H bar in, in, in units of H bar, this is the, the object that you can make um, that has dimensionality of the length square. And so it's a, a length scale that is the, the, the length scale of gravity because it, the Newton's constant enters there. And um, it's also quantum because the H bar enters there. Uh, as you can see very easily, they are in, in order to take Planck scale to, to zero, you, have, you can take two possible limits. So either H bar goes to zero, which is classical limit, then in this limit, Planck length goes to zero. And, and um, it, or you can take G Newton to code zero. Uh, the basically decouple gravity. Okay. So now there, there are plenty of length scales in between of this, this length. For example, I mean, there are different length scales. There are scales of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, planetary scales, etc. cetera. Um, now those scales, we, we don't consider to be fundamental because among many scales that, that nature offers to us. Uh, one of the important questions that we are, we, the, the fundamental physics deals with is which are the, which length scales are fundamental and which are simply emergent effective like length scales. Um, and um, so these two length scales, so the Planck scale, Planck length is certainly fundamental, okay? At the level of our understanding of nature, um, Hubble length, could be fundamental, we don't know. Um, there are many length scales in between, which we know that they are not fundamental, uh, but then there are length scales which are very important. Now, for example, of course, this, this, this scale is very schematic, that what, we're writing, what I'm writing here. Um, for example, somewhere here, let's say, let's write uh, QCD length, the length scale of strong interactions approximately 10 to the minus 14 centimeters or something like that. Um, now this length scale is uh, very important because that's the scale where the um, theory of strong interaction changes the regime. So becomes, depend, depending from which side you approach it, becomes a theory of ions or composites uh, or becomes a theory of quarks and gluons. Okay, at short distances, it's a theory of quarks and gluons. At large distances, it's a theory of, of composites, such as pions and other composites. Um, then there is a scale of uh, weak interaction, scale of the standard model, approximately 10 to the minus 16 centimeters or something like this. Okay, this is the scale of weak interaction. Mm -hmm. Approximately, this is given by the um, by the Compton wavelength of, of W and Z bosons in the standard model. Um, and nearby, nearby here, we have the length scale which we can call LHC length, C length, approximately ten to the minus seventeen centimeters. Okay. Um, this is the, why is length scale important? Obviously, it, we know why it is important because that's the experimental length scale, the length scale of um, the experimental probe of gravity by the standard model, okay? Uh, by the, by, 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 by experiments, by humans, okay? Um, of course, there are more energetic events in the, in the, even in the current universe, for example, high energy cosmic rays, etc. but, this is the scale, important scale, because this is probed by experiment, by an experiment that we can repeat, 
okay? Um, Large Hadron Collider. And furthermore, there are many scales here. For example, scale of grand unification, uh, God scale, scale of string theory, string scale, if you are, uh, if you are working in string theory, um, as, as possible UV completion of uh, gravity and so on. So this is um, the, uh, um, by huge order of magnitude, smaller, oh yeah, Planck's length. I should write that Planck length somewhere here. Planck length is approximately 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Okay. And, um, and the God scale is, I don't know, three orders of magnitude uh, larger. 10 to the 30 centimeters or something like that, 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, uh, something like that. Okay, so we have this bunch of length scales of nature and we are trying to understand at different length scales, but we are, we, we are, to, we are trying to understand in maximal elementary way, okay? The length scale. Now this, there is one important point that I, I, I want to make that um, elementarity, um, let me say elementarity um, is not necessarily the same thing as being uh, as, as, as a short scale, short length scale, okay? Because, for example, and I can have a photon, for example, I can have a photon with the Broglie wavelength of one kilometer or the Broglie wavelength of the size of the Hubble size, Hubble radius. And obviously, photon is an elementary particle, at least at the level of our understanding of nature, but the corresponding length scale can be huge. So. Therefore, when we're talking about elementary structures, we, we have to understand that this is not necessarily, elementarity doesn't necessarily mean um, being point-like or being, 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 being short scale, okay? Um, as I said, if there are any questions, please feel free to, to ask at this point, I don't know. Uh, okay, I didn't say anything very complicated, so probably there are no questions, but just in case, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. You can just speak up. Okay. Um, okay, so now um, let's see how we, um, how, are, how are we descri is describing, as I said, we are trying to describe nature at these length scales and What's the description? Um, what's the framework? And the framework is uh, quantum field theory. Okay, framework. Um, is uh, quantum field theory. Or to be more precise, effective. Sometimes we call it EFT, effective field theory effective quantum field theory, okay? Um, so what's the, so what, what is the main point here is that, now in general, this, this goes beyond quantum field theory. In general, when we have a, a system of nature, okay? So this system could be um, whatever you want, could be um, quantum field, or um, I don't know what, whatever, human brain or whatever you want. Um, if you have a system of nature, some system, this, we are always trying to understand what are the elementary degrees of freedom that, um, of this system, okay? That govern dynamics of the system, okay? Um, so we always describe, we have a system, and we always try to describe the system in terms of degrees of freedom. And of course, this is a very important concept, degrees of freedom. Now, the fact that you need degrees of freedom, this is always true. So I don't know, if you are working in many body physics, for example, if I'm interested in the air, let's say air in the room, 
uh, degrees of freedom that I will choose could be uh, molecules, molecular degrees of, degrees of freedom, or could be sound waves that propagate through the, the room. Okay, so for example, could be sound waves or could be molecules. Um, so the, the, the question of the, the choice of degrees of freedom, I'll come, I'll come back to that. Uh, but you, usually what we are try, trying to do when we are trying to understand a system of nature, we are trying to identify what are the degrees of freedom, what are the most convenient degrees of freedom that describe dynamics of this system, okay? Um, now, in, um, in quantum field theory, uh, degrees of freedom are, uh, it's convenient to, to use as degrees of freedom uh, quantum oscillators, okay? The, in QFT, uh, degrees of freedom are usually quantum oscillators. Um, now, these quantum oscillators, they, for example, they could be fermionic, could be bosonic, and they satisfy, you, they, you can arrange them in the form of standard uh, creation annihilation algebra, you have seen in, 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 in your courses on, on quantum field theory, of course, many times. I can label, for example, I can call them A. I can label them with the index J. And, um, and so these are creation and annihilation operators. And they satisfy creation and annihilation algebra, usually. For example, for bosons, uh, let's say J prime. This is delta J j prime okay now j is the label and which de describes identity of the given degree of freedom okay now this label stands for describes those quantum numbers or of the degree of freedom that, that are convenient for your you know, for your particular problem okay um, so they can describe electric charge, momentum, uh, spin, polarization, and so on, okay, of the degree of freedom. Um, or something else, I don't know, you can label some neural, neural network with these labels, etc. okay. Now in quantum field theory, um, now in QFT, um, we consider a situation normally, at least, okay, in my lectures, we will not go beyond this. The, the, the lectures will be focused on quantum field theories or asymptotically Poincare invariant vacuum, okay? So local field theories in, on asymptotically Poincare invariant vacuum. So correspondingly, in those QFTs that we will consider, those that describe also in particular beyond the standard model physics, the, the oscillators, these oscillators, they arrange themselves in such a way that they correspond to different vibration modes of a quantum field, all right? So you can, the quantum field represents a sum over uh, oscillators of uh, different species of oscillators, okay? Uh, with different quantum numbers. Now these quantum numbers, uh, because the interactions among a local quantum field, local quantum field, all right? Uh, because interactions are local, and uh, I insist on asymptotic Poincare invariance, um, the, the, the universally labels uh, are momentum, momentum eigenmods, and spin polarizations. And of course, the field can contain internal quantum number. Internal quantum numbers. For example, electric charge or color or, or flavor and this kind of thing, okay? So, okay, this is quantum field. So these are, um, this, of course, it's an operator, okay? 
I mean, obviously, this this expansion, uh, of course, in, in in reality, the expansion takes the form of there is expansion with some prefactors, with some complete set of functions that accompany these these creation and annihilation operators. Okay, for example, if field is real, then there'll be Hermitian conjugate and 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 so on, and this is a complete set set of eigenfunctions. Okay, for example, in on on Poincaré invariant vacuum that that we normally will assume these are plane waves. You can expand field in in plane waves, at least in asymptotic infinity. Okay. Um, all right. So now the question is, what um, what are the good degrees of freedom? All right. So which are good degrees of freedom? All right. I said that there is no, at least I don't know, any universal recipe that okay to tell you okay if you have this system then this is the degree of freedom and the, you have to stick to this choice of degrees of freedom there is nothing like this that i'm aware of so the choice of degrees of freedom is a matter of con convenience okay um but nevertheless this convenience is very important and so therefore we can ask this question what is the what are the we can we can we can classify degrees of freedom according to the more 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 most convenient ones and 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 less convenient ones so what are the good which are the good degrees of freedom i mean the good degrees of freedom for in my classification that that i will use will be um in our classification these are Weakly interacting degrees of freedom. Okay, weakly interacting. Um, in other words, so therefore, so the good degrees of freedom in terms of quantum oscillators or in terms of quantum fields. So each quantum field, of course, as I said. Each quantum field represents infinite tower of quantum oscillators. Infinite number of includes infinite number of oscillator species, okay, characterized with these different labels that, that correspond to the momenta and internal symmetries, okay. Um, so weak interaction means that uh, the, okay, one way you can think about it is, is the following. If you want to think in terms of oscillator, you can think in the following way, okay. Um, so think about the Hamiltonian of the system. All right. So there is, so Hamiltonian has a part which is diagonal in degrees of freedom. So, so the bilinear part in, in let's say quantum oscillators, I can always bring to a di diagonal form by a proper canonical transformation. And so let's say we have a, Let's say we have this index J corresponding frequencies and quantum oscillators. So this is a this is a free part of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now. And then on top of that, there, there are terms in the Hamiltonian which are uh, high order in creation and inflation operators, okay? Different possibilities, high order. Um, these are, they, they contain many, all possible products of creation and inflation operators, okay? Let's say a dagger, Okay, usually normal ordered. And so on, okay. 
and let me call this um so let me call this parameterize this as alpha i j m n times omega and I, i'll explain in a second and so on okay so there are high order operators that correspond to the interactions um so basically you can always find in, in, in any given, of course, these coefficients, these alpha coefficients, um, are subject to symmetries of the problem. You have they always they have to respect the symmetries of the problem. Um, now, um, so, so if we have a particular physics problem, okay, so we have a situation described by this Hamiltonian, and we are looking for a particular physics process. So think in the following way. I don't know, think, for example, think in Schrodinger picture or that you have a state vector. So there is some state vector at the initial time t zero, and then the state vector evolves, and then there is a finite say, some, some time um, t, okay? So there is an evolution of the state vector. Now, of course, evolution is unitary. We are assuming that Hamiltonian is Hermitian, et cetera. So what happens is that when you have a particular physics process, okay, this particular physics process in, in practice always has some finite effective duration, okay? Even if you are considering an S matrix process that is from minus infinity to plus infinity, the typical interaction time, typical transition time is always some finite time, okay? So the, the physical processes therefore explore effectively they explore some finite region of the Hilbert space, okay? So there is a region of the Hilbert space which is exp explored by a physical process. Now, what you want in order for these degrees of freedom to be weakly interacting, basically what we want is that, or we call these degrees of freedom weakly interacting throughout the process. If on the region of interest, which I can dash um, of Hilbert space of this process, which, which is explored by this process, the interaction Hamiltonian, this interaction Hamiltonian, let's call it interaction Hamiltonian, okay, uh, is less important than the free part of the Hamiltonian. In other words, approximately the Hamiltonian is diagonal on the Hilbert part of the Hilbert space of interest, okay? Approximately is diagonal. So then we can say that these degrees of freedom are weakly interacting during the process of interest. This is not always the case. The system can go out of this regime, okay? This happens very often. And in that case, of course, the, we have to change the description and re-diagonalize Hamiltonian and go into different bases and choose new degrees of freedom that are weakly interacting in that domain. In other words, we can have situation when there, there is a domain of the, where degrees of freedom A, certain degrees of freedom A um, are weakly interacting and another domain where other degrees of freedom, let's say, let's call them B, those are the ones that are weakly interacting. And our, of course, nature doesn't care about our description. So a given physical process may, may cross through this, may cross over into, in between the regions. And of course, then in that situation, we need to change our description. This is not easy. It, usually this is not terribly easy. Uh, requires some pretty sophisticated Gymnastic, and it actually is not even always possible because usually what happens is that um, when we um, cross from one description to the other, there is always a, a, a point, a boundary where both descriptions break down. Not, none of them is weakly interacting really, okay? And in this case, um, well, that's, that's, the case, that's the case we have to face, all right? Um, and then use some more powerful methods, maybe lattice or, or and so on to, 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 to handle the problem. Okay, so we encounter this kind of situation, okay, all the time. For instance, the, the uh, 
uh, even 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 beyond the quantum field theory, I mean the, the relativistic quantum field theory. For example, I, I gave you an example of the of the room, air in the room, air in the room, depending uh, at what length scales and, and what energy scales you are working, um, the a good degrees of freedom could be sound waves. Okay, for example, if you are interested in physics at low energies and wavelengths much larger than intermolecular distance in the room, then the, then the sound waves are perfectly nice description, okay? Um, a perfectly nice degrees of freedom, weakly interacting. But if you have to go through shorter scales, higher frequencies, high energies with distances um, where distances are uh, shorter than intermolecular distance, let's say, then of course you have to abandon the sound wave description. Sound waves, they're no longer good degrees of freedom and we go to molecular degrees of freedom, okay? Um, in quantum field theory, for example, well-known example is QCD. Um, in QCD, as I said, there is a length scale, QCD length, approximately 10 to the minus 14 centimeters or something like that, okay? And here, what happens is that the, the theory changes the regime. A distance is larger than uh, the QCD length in this domain. This is a theory of pions, okay, and other composites. Uh, a distance is shorter. These are, we have here gluons and quarks. So colored states. So QCD undergoes transition and this is precisely what's happening. So the, the, your Hamiltonian written in terms of uh, pions is no longer diagonal in, in this domain and vice versa, okay? And um, the, in between, there is a boundary in between where theory becomes strongly interacting. Um, okay, and we need some more powerful methods to, to, to handle it. Okay, um, any questions about these concepts of degrees of freedom? and strength and weak, strong and whatever. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking and uh, uh, so we choose mm -hmm. the degree for freedom that can deal with from perturbative method, right? Yeah, so that's the next thing exactly. So thanks for anticipating this because what um, the advantage of having weakly interacting degrees of freedom, and this is the, the, the question, um, the advantage is that we can do perturbation. Usually we can do perturbation theory because you, usually we can define a dimensionless parameter. So for, we, for weakly interacting, weakly interacting degrees of freedom, we can define, we can define a dimensionless coupling constant. I, I will denote it by alpha. Okay, of course you can denote it by something else. Uh, this is the coupling constant which controls, so this controls interaction among canonically normalized quantum fields. quantum fields, okay? So for example, I don't know, you can have gluon for gluon interaction. For instance, in this case, we can have alpha QCD and so on. And so we can define um, the alpha, a weak, um, weak object, uh, weak um, coupling. And so we can work in expansion in series so, so that we can work uh, in perturbative expansion. In alpha, okay? So we can work in perturbative expansion in alpha. Now, um, of course, it's important to understand that sooner or later, 
for example, you, for instance, we can work in perturbative expansion in alpha for in using uh, for Feynman diagrams, okay? So, for, for example, I don't know, we can, we can work in, and so on, okay? Now, the thing is, however, you have to be careful because these perturbative series, they are asymptotic series. So uh, for, if we, for example, if you want, if you work in expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams, the, the, the per perturbation theory sooner or later again breaks down because of multiplicity of Feynman diagrams, because multiplicity of Feynman diagrams grows factorially, okay, with, with loops, for instance, with loops, okay? And um, this is a, so, so, so beyond that, you have to take, take additional measures. Typically, this happens at the loop, n loop order, n loop order where n is approximately one over alpha. So if n is much less than one over alpha, so typically for n much less than one over alpha, uh, perturbative expansion is, is, is okay. Okay. So in other words, yes, having weakly interacting degrees of freedom allows us to do perturbation theory in those, in those degrees of freedom. So does this answer your question also, right? Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, anything else? I do have one if, if, uh, if it's time. Um, yeah, of course, so I have infinite time, question... so you can ask me any question, yes. <laughs> Very well. So the question is, at some point you said that um, sometimes it is not possible to, let's say, redefine the degrees of freedom in such a way that we obtain a, a weakly interacting theory. But my question is, can we be sure about that? Is it possible to be sure if you have a theory and in some scenarios you believe that and you yeah. cannot find a way to map the degrees of freedom to a weakly interacting theory? Is it possible to prove that it is not possible or it's just like uh, guessing? Yeah, so very good. So, okay, just maybe to, to a little bit elaborate on a question. So question concerns, again, this crossing from one type of degrees of freedom to the other domain. And usually, as I said, usually when this happens, there is a boundary in between where both, both expansions break down, okay? And that's natural because you see, think in the following way, there is some weak, there is some weak coupling here, alpha A, and here there is another weak coupling alpha B. And normally you cannot do analytic expansion in two, you are normally doing expansion in one parameter, okay? So perturbative series are perturbative series in one parameter and the other parameters, usually they are non-perturbative. So therefore, Typically what happens is that the, the fact that alpha becomes strongly interacting means that alpha A becomes order one around this, this, this boundary, okay? Somewhere when we cross through, okay? And um, so the, and what, ha what happens is that if, we, if we, since boundary is well-defined, typically, usually, when you come from the domain B, the other way around happens. For example, I gave you an example, the pions and, and, and gluons and quarks, right? So, um, and so usually we encounter this, this, this place where both expansions break down and, um, and we have to use other methods, which means that that's not a, per se, that's not, a, that's not an inconsistency of the theory, okay? Um, because, Degrees of freedom are our language, okay? So this is very important to understand. Nature doesn't care what kind of language we, we use. Uh, nature is what it is, okay? And um, unfortunately, the, the languages that we use becomes not effective. Th those languages become not effective at the boundary. Um, and... Um, but that doesn't mean the theory is inconsistent. It's just simply the languages are not good enough. And so 
the, usually what we do, for example, in QCD, case of QCD, we try to use some non-perturbative methods, methods, methods that depend, do not depend on perturbation series, for example, lattice and et cetera. Um, now, your question is whether this is always the case that when I, I choose a, a, a domain where I have good degrees of freedom, it, sooner or later, if, I, if, if, if at some point these this, this good degrees of freedom, they break down as, as good degrees of freedom, whether there is always a boundary at, on which I, I, ne I need to use some non perturbative methods. And um, in all the examples I know, that is the case. Um, now, whether, of course, in physics, usually it's very hard to prove uh, impossible uh, because, I mean, we always work within certain framework, uh, questions we can only ask within that framework, and also so proofs or arguments we can also provide within that framework. And so therefore, um, I don't have a proof that that's always the case has to be the case. Um, but in the examples that I know, for example, in uh, QCD, etc., usually that's what happens. So usually when, when there is a boundary between two descriptions, um, usually you have to use some other, uh, some other method, okay? So of course you can, you, you may still have some perturbation theory in some other parameters. Um, we, how we, for example, one over n expansion in, in large QCD and so on. Um, but in terms of degrees of freedom, when degrees of freedom encounter this boundary, usually this is what happens. That at those boundaries, we need to, we need to use perturb, no, some, no, some non perturbative methods. But the question is very good. I would love to know the answer in general. Um, looks like that's the case. Uh, lo looks like that is the case, and we have to live with it. Okay. If you ask my opinion, yeah, that's what I think. Um, okay, does this answer your question? Of course, I, I understand that your question is not answerable, but but okay, whatever, within the within the framework of these lectures at least. Um, Thank you. All right, is there anything else about this? What we just said, what we just discussed? Okay, I don't hear any any other questions. Let's um, let, let's continue, right? So, um, so we um, let's come let, now. Let's come to the standard model, okay? So these descriptions, as I said, in terms of good degrees of freedom, we call effective descriptions, okay? So always. In, in all the examples I know, description is always some effective description um, within that domain, okay? Because usually that description breaks down either in infrared or in ultraviolet, okay? Um, so now let's come to the standard model, okay? Again, standard model, we think that standard model is an effective description of nature. Uh, extremely powerful, extremely successful, um, because um, of two reasons. Uh, first, so the standard model, uh, extremely successful. Description uh, of nature because they are in particular. So in the standard model, th there, there is no experimental data that would make us think that standard model is inconsistent. No experimental data indicating inconsistency of the standard model. Sure, of course, incompleteness, yes. Of course, there is experimental data, I come back to it, that, that tells us that the standard model is incomplete. It's not the, the end, end, end story, okay? Um, 
And secondly, uh, there are some theoretical issues, but they are, for example, Landau Paul, et cetera, theoretical potential, I mean, let me call them potential inconsistencies. I put them in the quotation marks because they are, they are not really inconsistent because they, if they set in, they set in at extremely high, uh, extremely short distances. At extremely short distances. Um, so they set in at distances so short that we, they, we cannot really consider them as inconsistencies because we know that there is new physics beyond the standard model, which would one has to take into account at those short energy scales. Okay, and other than this, the standard model is extremely successful, right? Because of these properties. Um, Excuse me, for yes, what sure. order? Mm -hmm. uh, for what order is uh, what order makes theoretical potential inconsistency in standard model? No, no, I mean, I meant like, for example, the, the, if, you, if, you, if we naively extrapolate standard model, which would be a, a silly because we know that standard model is not alone, there is also, for example, gravity. There are other degrees of freedom, very likely. I'll come back to those, okay? Uh, but if we take simply standard model and naively extrapolate it at su sufficiently high energies, okay? Extremely short distances, we will encounter some strong coupling issues, for instance, okay? So, but uh, what I meant is that, uh, that, that this type of phenomena cannot be really called inconsistency of the standard model because they happen at extremely short distances where we know anyway that there, there is physics beyond the standard model that will contribute, for example, gravity, okay? Is this clear? Uh -huh. I got it. Okay. All right, very good. Anything else? All right. Okay, so therefore, what are the building blocks of the standard model? Let, let's re recall briefly, what are the building blocks of the standard model? Because since we need to go beyond, um, okay, let's, let's make some, uh, refresh our memory about the building blocks of the standard model. So the, the QFT building blocks of the standard model. Um, so these are quantum fields, obviously, All right? Now the standard model is a gauge theory. It's, it's a theory based on gauge symmetry. So the standard model, right, uh, describes so three interactions. And these interactions, of course, we know what they are. They are strong, weak, and electromagnetic. Okay, um, now these interactions, they have messengers, okay? These interactions, these interactions, they have messengers. Meaning they're mediated by messengers, they are mediated. mediated by messengers. Um, and these messengers, they have spin one. All the messengers of these three interactions, they have, they are spin one particles or spin one fields. I see another hand. Omar is asking yes, something. Yes, uh, so, yeah. Yes, so hi, my question is, uh, um, 
why is usually not considered like the Yukawa interaction as another um, interaction of the standard model? Because in principle, well, of course, it is another in, interaction. We will also consider that <laughs> by no means I'm going to dismiss Yukawa interactions of the standard model. I'm, I'm going step by step. So, so far, first, I am describing what we call traditionally uh, strong, weak, okay. and electromagnetic interactions. So far, I'm discussing those. So of course, we get to the Yukawa interactions. They are extremely important, obviously, in the standard model. So I'm not going to dismiss no, Yukawa interactions. The, the, mm -hmm. No, yes, but it was like a perspective question because usually when one speaks of the fundamental interactions of nature, one usually yeah. says there are there are three interactions uh, plus gravity, let's say. And usually yeah, the Yukawa interaction is not uh, considered when one speaks of the fundamental interactions in nature. So uh, I would like to know what, what's your perspective on that? Why okay. does this yeah, happen? Right. So I don't share the, <laughs> I don't share this, this perspective. Now, um, obviously, any interaction is as good as any other interaction. Okay, um, so and therefore, but this is okay. Sometimes you, we have to understand in particle physics. Sometimes we get terminology, the, which is also partially based on historic developments, right? And uh, when we use terminology, uh, when someone says that the standard model describes three inter three interactions of nature. Uh, okay what i just listed strong weak electromagnetic interaction um okay this is they, this refers to precisely the spin one sector of the theory okay right and i mean of course everybody understands that yukawa interactions or self-interaction of the higgs and other interactions are equally important so therefore nobody is really dismissing those interactions as interactions it's just historically because Electromagnetic interaction was discovered very early, okay, in human history, and then later strong and weak. Um, and um, Yukawa interaction really was put forward after papers by Weinberg, Glacier, Weinberg, Salam, because they introduced coupling the, the generation, especially Weinberg introduced generation of the thermal masses through the Yukawa, Yukawa interactions. So they appeared later. So that's the only reason. But uh, absolutely, you are absolutely correct. Yukawa interactions are as legitimate as any other interaction in the standard model. Okay. So Yukawa interaction, by the way, I'll, I'll discuss that. Uh, it's good that you are bringing this up. Yukawa interaction mediates a force by the exchange, for example, among the fermions, it mediates a force by the exchange of a Higgs quantum. So Higgs particle mediates a force among fermions. Um, this force, by the way, is shares some similarity with gravity. Okay. So therefore, by no means this force can be dismissed. Uh, okay. All right. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, okay. I see that we are already one hour in our lecture. So let's make a break. Yes. All right, very good. Let's continue. So, yeah, if there are any, of course, if any questions accumulated during the break, please uh, ask me. Otherwise, we continue. Um, now, the uh, as I said, so the the these three three interactions, strong, weak, and weak and electromagnetic, they have messengers um, and mediators. Okay, so they are mediated by um, messengers, particles, or fields that have a spin uh, equals to one, okay, all of those. Um, and and um, so, so theories, so in general, there is a general observation, okay, that um, uh, fields, I mean, theories of the fields, theories, uh, of a spin larger or equal to one, they exhibit gauge redundancy. Uh, in fact, even so, okay, let me first. So now I want to open the parentheses. This will become important when we discuss certain um, aspects of a strong CP problem. Um, that so even even pseudoscalars uh, 
can be reformulated in gauge redundant way. Okay, but uh, for uh, for uh, th for theories that this right particle spin one or higher, that's mandatory. So we we, we don't have any other description other than gauge redundant description. Okay. Now, again, the, it's, it's a very good question whether gauge redundancy is fundamental. So, for example, for example. Maxwell theory. Okay, Maxwell theory um, of a photon. Let me let me call let me denote photon by um, gamma gamma mu. Okay, so Maxwell theory uh, with Lagrangian usual Maxwell Lagrangian, which is f mu nu f mu nu, where f mu nu is anti-symmetric derivative. Okay, this Lagrangian and um, sure gamma, the photon can couple to a conserved source. Um, this theory exhibits, exhibits gauge redundancy, right? Because um, sorry. we can change by uh, photon field by a derivative by uh, by derivative arbitrary function of arbitrary scale. Now, because of this gauge redundancy, the Maxwell equation, which has form, this implies that the source must be conserved, as you know very well, okay? So, and similar gauge redundancies are part of all theories with spin one, okay? It's as we have in the standard model. Now, the question is, is gauge redundancy fundamental? Or it's just because we are not smart enough to, to, to offer uh, a better description. Um, the the answer I don't know on that question, but it looks like it is fundamental. Okay, somehow redundancy is the fundamental part of 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 description of particles with with spin one and, and higher. Okay, um, so they all exhibit gauge redundancy. Now, what are the, the building blocks, right? And so this gauge redundancy effectively is described, uh, so the gauge redundancy, see, of the standard model is effectively described as SU3 color cross SU2 weak cross U1 hypercharge local symmetry, okay? Local or gauge symmetry. Okay, so it is a redundancy of the description that is which is described, uh, parameterized in, in, in terms of this local symmetry. Now, correspondingly, the messengers of the standard model, spin one building blocks of the standard model, they, belong to a joint representations of this of this symmetry uh, symmetry groups okay so here we have uh, gluons let me put them so, some index a where a goes from one to eight so these are gluons uh, and here in this sector because of Higgs effect, because of Higgs phenomena, what happens is that this sector rearranges itself in such a way that we have W plus minus at the end of the day at low energies, we have W plus minus 
and Z bosons that are massive and a photon, massless. Now, strictly speaking, we don't know whether the photon is massless. We only, we can only, at the current level of understanding, we can put bounds, experimental bounds on the mass of the photon, okay? So massless, massless means that something like the mass of the photon, the current experimental bound, uh, if you are very conservative, is something like uh, the mass has to be less than 10 to the minus 14 or 17 electron volts, depending to, to whom you, to whom you talk, talk. Um, okay. Um, now, gluons are massless. Massless at the fundamental level. Uh, so gluons are massless at the fundamental level. Uh, meaning that they, the Lagrangian of gluons in the standard model doesn't include an a priori mass term, okay? However, the theory of strong interaction exhibits a mass gap. However, SU3 color exhibits a mass gap due to confinement. Okay. Now, of course, this confinement on its own is an extremely interesting phenomena, which takes place in the standard model. So we standard model has part which is confining. Uh, so in general, there are three phases, three main phases of, uh, there are others, but more, more, more exotic, but there are three main phases of gauge theory, okay? So three main phases. of spin one gauge theory. So there are three main phases of so spin one gauge theory. One is Coulomb phase. What happens in the Coulomb phase? In the Coulomb phase, this is the, the, the story with photon, assuming that photon is massless. What happens in the Coulomb phase is that if I have sources and I mediate force amongst sources, some sources, okay, heavy sources, let's say. The force mediated among heavy sources, the, the potential mediated by sources, let me call it B of R, is long range, decays as one over R, okay? So this is typical for Coulomb law, okay? So the, the, the potential mediated by massless spin one field in the Coulomb phase is the case as one over R, okay? So it's a long range interaction. There is another phase so-called, which we call Higgs, or sometimes we call it Proca phase. And in that phase, what happens is that the, a, a, a particle acquires a fundamental mass, okay? And so in that case, the, for example, if, if photon were massive or W and Z bosons, for example, Z boson, okay? In this case, the potential is what we call U cover type. So, okay? So this is what is called U cover type potential. Now the, so you got, so don't get confused with terminology because there was also a question, remember about what about Yukawa terms in the standard model. Yukawa terms in the standard model, that's a separate story. We, we normally, we, we refer to them as interaction with the Higgs, but Yukawa potential, Yukawa type force is mediated always by a massive messenger. So a, a massive messenger, which has a mass at the fundamental level, as a fundamental particle, has a mass, Med mediates a force that is exponentially suppressed 
distances larger than the Compton wavelength of a messenger. This is a very important phenomenon in physics in general. So you should remember this and, and know this because this is what happens in uh, physics in three plus one dimensions. Of course, we are in three plus one dimensions. Um, what happens is that the massless particles mediates a force, massless boson, massless spin one particle mediates a force that is one that is potent, mediates a potential that is one over R, okay, long range. A massive mediates an exponentially suppressed uh, for uh, interaction potential at distances larger than the Compton wavelength of a particle. Okay, this, this is extremely important. Now, this is in particular this is the reason why at the at the distances at the, at, the, at macroscopic distances we can measure electromagnetic force, but we cannot measure force mediated by Z boson. Okay. The, the Compton wavelength of a Z boson is approximately 10 to the minus 16, minus 16 centimeters or something like that, okay? Sergio has a question. Yes, please. Um, yes, I was wondering, uh, since you, you said the gluon has fundamentally no mass, I was yeah. wondering the, the photon, uh, is, is it not incompatible with the standard model to give a mass to the photon? No, of course you have to do. You have to. You have to go beyond the standard model. Obviously, the, with the way photon is defined, what we call standard model in the standard model, as it was written by Weinberg and, 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 and Salam, and uh, subsequently, there photon has no mass. So yes, in defining standard model as, as historically as what the standard model is, of course photon has no mass. But that's not a very informative statement because at the end of the day, in physics, the same, for example, the same is true about neutrinos in the standard model, within the standard model, as, as defined historically in Weinberg's paper, okay, for example, uh, part of leptons, neutrino has no mass there, but that doesn't mean that neutrino is massless, obviously we know that neutrino has a mass. So the photon mass is a little bit more sophisticated, it's a little bit more subtle than neutrino mass, but still photon can have a mass. And that requires a, a really a not much effort, a minimal extension of the standard model, uh, all, although effort, almost effortlessly can give photon a mass. Basically, you can simply, one, one thing you can do, you can simply write down mass for a photon in the standard model. That theory turns out on its own, if we forget about gravity and ultraviolet completions, an effective theory is a consistent theory, okay? So in other words, you can add a mass to the standard model Photon mass. How can you add the photon mass? You have to add, of course, mass to for the for the for the U1 hypercharge. You have to add mass to the abelian part to the hypercharge, and that's that would give mass to a photon. Okay. Um, so within the the standard model, within the effective theory description of the standard model, we can put experimental bounds on that mass. These the bounds are what I said. Okay, um, but. But of course, the, the, then we can have some other theoretical ideas, uh, which um, can give us more input, whether this mass is really there, okay? But this requires going at much shorter distances. This, this requires going towards ultraviolet completion of the standard model. For example, let me give you an example. If standard model is embedded in grand unified theory, then photon cannot have a mass. For example, in grand unification, there is no way to, to write down the mass of a photon, which would be both consistent and experimentally, uh, consistent both theoretically and experimentally. That's impossible. For example, grand unification immediately excludes the mass for the photon. But the standard model alone, without grand unification, yeah, in principle, you can have a photon mass. All right, does this answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. All right. And, um, finally, th there is a third phase, which is so-called confining phase. Okay, so the gauge theory can also be, turns out that the gauge theory can also be in so-called confining phase. Now, confining phase is very interesting because look, what is happening here? In the Coulomb phase, Right in the Coulomb phase, if I have a point-like source, for example, I can think of one of these so sources as, as point-like. What happens is that the, the you can think in terms of electro electric flux lines, and simply what you have to in order to get Coulomb law, 
the only thing you have to impose is the conservation of the flux, okay, right? So the simply that flux lines do not decay, they, they do, do not terminate, they can only terminate on charges. If you, in, if you impose this condition, the, by symmetry, the Coulomb law follows, okay? In Yukawa case, the flux lines, they terminate in the vacuum. So in other words, if I have a charged particle and I am within the Compton wavelength of a messenger, then the situation, as you can see from this expression, the exponent is of order one. And so situation looks like as if I am in the massless theory. But beyond this point, flux simply terminates. So we call this screening. So what happens is that the charge, if you are, if you are an observer that goes farther, you, no, you can no longer measure an electric field coming from the charge. So the charge, the flux lines can terminate in, in the vacuum, okay? They sort of terminate into nothingness. Finally, there's a confining phase. Now in confining phase, what happens is that the, a, a quantum number of the gauge field in particular, in the case of SU2, we have color, becomes unobservable, okay? So in other words, for example, in confining theory, if I have a, a, a source, for example, a heavy quark, I take a heavy quark. Artificially, I introduce some heavy source, okay? So what happens is that the flux lines are conserved, but instead the flux gathers into a tube, okay? So the flux, somehow like this gathers into a tube. And this tube has to ter terminate on a, on a different charge. So for example, you can have a different charge particle here. So in other words, what happens is that because the entire flux is in the tube for an external observer becomes the, the, the color quantum number becomes unobservable. So it's an interesting sort of a, possibility when the charge lines are conserved, so the flux lines are conserved, sort of, but the, the flux gets confined into a tube, okay? And so, for example, you, I, you can have a quark here, an anti-quark here, and they are connected, they will be connected by QCD flux tube. In real QCD, this flux will, can break because you can produce, the, because quarks are light, you can break the flux tube and produce uh, a bunch of quark and anti-quark pairs. But uh, okay, this is not essential for this discussion. And so these three phases of gauge fields, all of them are presented in the standard model. So standard model accommodates all three phases of the, in which the spin one gauge, all, all three major phases. There are other phases that, which are more exotic, uh, which I'm not discussing. I still see a hand, Sergio has a hand, but um, raised hand, but is this from the previous question or? Yeah, probably. Uh, yes, sorry. No, no problem. No. Okay, so there are these three stories. So, so this is gluon flux, color flux. Okay. And this is why, despite the fact that gluons have no, no fundamental mass, okay, they are not like W and Z bosons. They don't have fundamental mass. Um, despite this fact, the theory has a mass gap because this confinement generates an energy gap in the theory, okay? So because gluon is not observable, is no longer an elementary, a good degree of freedom at large distances, it simply st stops to exist for a large distance observer. Large distance observer only sees composite objects like pions, for example, mesons, um, and, okay, glue balls and so on. Okay, so this is the gauge sector of the uh, building blocks of the standard model, okay? So then there, are these, then there is an ingredient which we sometimes we call matter, okay? Next ingredient. Now, again, these names are, okay, some of those names are simply because of historic reasons, because of course, in, in terms of quantum field theory, gluons, W and Z bosons, a photon, they are elementary particles, okay? And uh, fermions, the, the, what we call normally matter, they are also elementary particles. So from that point of view, I mean, they are, they are equally legitimate. 
okay so normally what we call matter is the stuff that carries uh, spin one half okay so spin one half sector of the standard model is sometimes called matter although again i say i say all these names you have to you have to understand you have to take with the grain of salt because Photon is as good matter as or as as, uh, as as a fermion. Okay, um, okay. So these so the fermions they come in generations in the standard model. And by the way, this is one of the puzzles, right, in the standard model, which is a flavor sector of the standard model. Very interesting. So you will have lectures on that, right? And so now uh, we can classify according to uh, su2 cross u1 quantum numbers or basically su2 quantum numbers electronic quantum numbers and as you know so fermions we can so as you know from quantum field theory qft courses and pr presumably you have taken course on the standard model the fermions uh, can be of um, depending how you generate mass of the fermion uh, you can either introduce fermion in wild basis uh, or Dirac basis or Majorana basis. Okay, so the elementary fermionic degree for if fermion is a massless if if fermion is a massless fermion, elementary fermionic degree to, of freedom you can write it. For example, fermion psi. Okay, you can write it as a wild spinner with definite chirality. Okay, uh, let's say left-handed chirality. All right, so this is an elementary building block for the fermion and it is particularly useful this this basis is useful if fermion carries a conserved charge for example if, if fermion carries an electric charge it's, it's useful to introduce it as a, as a vile fermion now we vile fermion we can introduce with chirality okay and so chirality left-handed chirality or right-handed chirality depending of the eigenvalue of the gamma 5 matrix right and um, so, so now we can introduce fermion as right-handed chirality. A priori, there is no there is no preference. But what is important is that we can introduce standard model in either left-right basis, okay, or in left-left basis. We can also do it in right-right basis. So in the left-left basis, you can rewrite a right-handed fermion right handed vial fermion as a left-handed anti-fermion okay so this you can rewrite so as as left-handed and let me put it c there uh, just to uh, indicate that this is an anti-fermion left-handed anti-fermion okay so therefore in the standard model the left and right-handed components of ordinary fermions for example electron or a quark because they are massive right and left-handed fermions at the level of the standard model at the fundamental level they are introduced as independent particles right as independent vial fermions but the basis you can choose you can introduce them as left right or you can introduce them as left left instead of right-handed fermions you can introduce left-handed anti-fermions okay um, all right so therefore now what we so in the in the traditional uh, language usually i I think the, the language in which the old fermions, fermions are on left-right basis is, is, is more common. Um, so the, what is important is that the SU2, SU2, um, SU2 acts non-trivially on the left-handed components only, okay? I mean, on, it acts on trivial and one of the chiralities which we introduce as left-handed, okay? Um, so correspondingly, the gauge bosons of SU2, they couple only to the left chirality, okay? Of fermions, for example, W plus minus. Uh, Z, no, because Z mixes with U1 hypercharge. So, so correspondingly, the left-handed fermions we can introduce as doublets under SU2, and right hand, right hand fermions as singlets. So, so the first one per each generation, okay, we have, for example, first generation, we have up quark and down quark, and this is left handed, and I'm, I have introduced them as doublet, okay, each of them is a vial fermion. I'm suppressing the color index, 
So of course they also carry color index. They ca come in three copies of color. Then there is uh, right-handed up quark and right-handed down quark. And as I said, instead of these, we can trade to left-handed anti-quark and left-handed anti-quark down, okay? Then we have leptons and we have neutrino and electron neutrino and electron left-handed. And we have neutrino right-handed. We don't know. So within the standard model, so neutrinos is a separate story. So within the standard model, this is a question mark, okay? Um, but in any case, if it's there, we can trade it for the electron left-handed anti-neutrino. And of course we have here right-handed electron and right-handed, or we can introduce this as, as left-handed positron. Okay, so this is third generation in the standard model. Now, the thing is that there are three copies of this. As, and as I said, this is one of the mysteries of the standard model. Three copies in the following sense that the quantum numbers under the gauge symmetry uh, and under the global symmetries, such as baryon and lepton numbers are identical, but they, but they come in three copies, but they differ in masses, okay? So the, there is a carbon copy. The, so therefore there, is, there, there are copies of this as C and S, okay? Similar story with CR, SR. Let me not repeat this uh, doubling with the, and we have uh, muon neutrino, muon, and uh, muon R with question mark, and uh, mu R, and we have top and bottom quarks, uh, right-handed, bottom right-handed, and we have here tau neutrino, tau left-handed, and tau R right-handed with a question mark, and tau lepton right-handed. Okay, and now instead of writing it like this, uh, as, as three copies carrying it around, we can simply put a generation index. So in other words, I can simply put a generation index, A, where A goes to A or B. One, two, three, okay, three generations on the fermions. Okay, so finally, so this is the fermion content of the standard model. And finally, we have Higgs, Higgs field, which plays a very important role in the standard model. Higgs is introduced as a doublet, which has two components, upper component and lower component. Um, because Higgs is a, a scalar, um, obviously the, by conjugation, we can get a doublet with an opposite hypercharge. So correspondingly, there is a freedom with what hypercharge you introduce the, the Higgs doublet, okay? Standard model contains only one Higgs doublet. Standard model as, as it is defined as a standard model contains only one Higgs doublet. Now, Higgs doublet is important because it has to, it, it gets expectation value, okay? So in other words, in the vacuum that we live in, in, in our vacuum, the, the vacuum has non-zero expectation value of the Higgs doublet, okay? Now, in other words, the, the vacuum of the standard model is filled with Higgs condensate. Now this condensate by due to gauge redundancy, you can bring it to an arbitrary form. In particular, you can bring it into the form in which you have, for example, only one component non-zero and real, okay? So we, V is positive. You can bring this to, to this form by choosing the gauge, but you cannot eliminate V, okay? No matter what gauge transformation you do, you cannot eliminate the absolute value of the condensate. So the vacuum contains a non-zero condensate. The way you can think about it is as if our vacuum in which we live is filled by condensed Higgs particles. However, this may create a puzzle because 
normal condensates that we can produce in laboratory, right? For example, in condensed matter or whatever, normal condensates, they, co they, they have actual particles in them. Correspondingly, they cost energy, normal condensates, they cost energy. Or to be more precise, normal condensates, they are not Poincare invariant. Normal condensate looks different in different from the point of view, different reference frames, okay? This is not true about the Higgs condensate. So this is important to remember that when we say that Higgs condensate is condensate of Higgs particles, you have to be very careful what we mean under that, okay? It's, this is not a condensate of, of actual particles. The, 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 the constituents of the condensate, they do not have dispersion relations of ordinary particles. The best way to approximate, to, to understand what is happening is to think of this condensate as condensate of tachyons, okay? So this was, uh, I think they, where I have, I've seen this introduced in uh, all the lectures by, by Nielsen, this description in terms of this tachyon condensate. But in, in any case, I mean, whether you want to call them tachyons or not, it doesn't matter. Just you have to remember that this condensate is not condensate of ordinary particles, okay? So, and because of this, this is a very special condensate, which doesn't break Poincare invariance. So from, in all the reference frames, this condensate looks the same, okay? Once you fix the gauge, once you choose it by fixing the gauge, it looks the same in all the reference frames. So correspondingly, that's why we don't notice it. Uh, but the amount of the condensate is huge. The V is approximately 100 GV, actually 250 or something, right? It's a huge condensate, but we don't notice it because it doesn't break gauge invariance. Sorry, it doesn't break it. It doesn't break the Poincaré invariance. Okay, and um, so it doesn't produce a wind of ether. There's no ether associated with this condensate. Now, however, this condensate does something very important because it gives masses to W and Z bosons, and also it gives masses to fermions through what there was a question about Yukawa interactions, okay? So there is a structure, therefore there is a structure of Yukawa interactions. Now, if I denote this, let's introduce a notation, let's call this index alpha. We can call this index alpha SU2 index, one, two, okay? So SU2 index. So correspondingly, all these uh, quark doublets will have SU2 index, okay, somewhere here, all right? Now let's introduce notations again. So let me call uh, quark doublet, let me denote it by QL and with index alpha, all right? And uh, so it will be U and the flavor index A, okay? U, D, L, okay? And the alpha will stand for U or D and the flavor index A. And the lepton doublet, let me denote it by nu and uh, E with corresponding index A. Uh, again, A is the flavor index. Left-handed, sorry, here we have right-handed. Right-handed with some flavor index again. And here we have a similar story with question mark, obviously. And uh, here we have corresponding left turn. Okay, so A is a flavor index, flavor or generation index. Index one, two, three. Okay. And alpha is an SU2 index. Okay. So with these notations, we can write now now Yukawa couplings. Okay. With the so for example, we can write Yukawa coupling between Higgs and the quark tablet. Okay. Now here you as I said, you have the freedom. You have a freedom whether to introduce Higgs as a doublet or an anti-doublet, depending on the hypercharge. Okay, so let's once let's introduce this way. So Q bar is a Lorentz, is a Dirac conjugation. Okay. Alpha L, and then we have U R. Of course, I have to add here flavor index, some uh, the generation index somewhere. Let, let me add here R A and let me add here B. Okay. And correspondingly, there will be a coupling constant. Normally we call it Yukawa coupling, GAB, and let me call it U, okay, GAB and U. Now, if we introduce it like this, then 
the hypergels, as you know, uh, hypergel. Of course, here I'm reminding you simply the structure. Of course, these, not, these are not the lectures of the standard model. I want to go through this as quickly as possible to set the stage in order for setting the stage for physics beyond the standard model, right? So, correspondingly, now we can I can introduce for d quark, but for d quark with this choice, I have to do conjugation. Okay, so what do we do? We conjugate things. We form an anti-doublet, and then through the epsilon tensor, we of the SU2 and the epsilon tensor, we now couple it to a d quark, right handed d quark. Okay, and so here again we have a and b. Now correspondingly, we will have we can write coupling with neutrinos if right handed neutrino exists. Okay, as I said, we don't know if it does with leptons. And with charged fermions, with charged leptons. Okay, so these are these famous uh, Yukawa coupling terms that are responsible for generating the masses of fermions. Okay, I see some question in the chat. Okay, so there is a question in the chat, uh, whether there is a, an, any theoretical reason why the number of quark generations is the same as number of lepton generations, okay? So for example, why can't we have only quarks without leptons or let's say two generations of leptons with one generation of quarks? The, the answer is yes, there is a very powerful theoretical reason for that, so-called anomaly cancellation, okay? For instance, it turns out that the, the, the gauge theory, if we had less quarks than uh, less generations of quarks or leptons, different number of generations, the anomalies as they are in the standard model will no longer be canceled, okay? So anomaly is something, now anomaly is an extremely interesting phenomena in quantum field theory and uh, an known anomaly, one has to give separate set of lectures. Um, now, what is anomaly? Anomaly is the, usually is the situation when we have a symmetry that is a good symmetry at the classical level but is broken by quantum corrections, okay? Now, um, if symmetry is broken, if symmetry is a global symmetry, and, and we will encounter such a global symmetry, there are global symmetries in, in standard model that are broken by anomaly, uh, that's not a big deal. And actually that's a very good thing. It turns out that for example, eta prime mass is generated by uh, precisely the, 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 the breaking of global symmetry, chiral, chiral global symmetry by the anomaly. However, if symmetry is a gauge symmetry, the story becomes extremely subtle, okay? And um, anomaly cancellation is one of the requirements in order to have an, a valid effective field theoretic description of a gauge redundancy, of a gauge redundant theory. So correspondingly, the standard model, these, uh, the, the, the anomalies of leptons and quarks, they cancel among each other, okay? And um, I mean, gauge anomalies, SU2, SU2 cross U1 anomalies, SU3, SU2 cross U1 anomalies. Um, they cancel among each other. And this is very important. Um, so uh, let me not elaborate more on this. I'll come back to the anomalies when we discuss, um, when we discuss global um, chiral, chiral anomaly, okay? Um, at the moment, let, let me... Let me leave it like this, unless you want me to now enter into discussion of the anomalies, but okay. Um, okay, so now coming back to the generation of the masses, right? What happens is that I choose expectation value of the Higgs doublet to be, okay? 
And I plug it there everywhere, right? So what do we get? So by the way, by the way, so the, the following is, is, is true. So in general, the Higgs doublet, we can parameterize as the absolute value, as the absolute value, let me call it rho of the Higgs doublet. And, um, and the, the, the angles and phases. For example, I can parameterize as three, three uh, using three angles, uh, cosine exponent I alpha, and let's say sine of theta exponent I beta, okay? Now, in other words, uh, any doublet, we can parameterize in this way. We can parameterize it as an absolute value and orientations in the SU2 space theta, alpha, and beta, okay? So by gauge transformation, gauge transformation affects theta, alpha, and beta. These are fields, all of them, okay? So gauge transformation affects theta, alpha, and beta, okay? And we can change those. For example, we can bring the system in this form. In other words, we can bring the Higgs doublet by doing fixing the by, by, by choosing gauge transformation appropriate. We can fix Higgs doublet as rho of x, uh, and then here one and zero. Okay. Now, so the rho is the part of the Higgs doublet that is gauge singlet. It, the gauge transformation doesn't affect rho. Rho is an absolute value of the Higgs. It's a, it's a length of the Higgs Higgs field, and that is not affected by the uh, by, by, by the SU2 cross U1 transformation. SU2 cross U1 transformation affects the, the angles, theta, alpha, and beta, okay? So the condensate, therefore, of rho, expectation value of rho is given by V, and small fluctuations of rho around this condensate, these represent a Higgs boson, what we call a Higgs boson. Okay, so this is the particle for, for which um, Engler, uh, Francois Engler and, and, and Higgs, they, they got the Nobel Prize for discovery. So this is a fluctuation of rho around its vacuum expectation value, okay? So correspondingly, now, if we take this form and plug it here, or in this parameterization, this is simply a, a fluctuation of V, okay, if you, want. if you take and plug it here, we'll get the, the masses for fermions and their couplings with the Higgs boson, okay? So we'll get G of a given fermion, okay? Let me not repeat the, uh, because we are going toward, towards the end of the lecture, let me not repeat the old denotation. So given fermion psi, psi okay, with flavor structure, and we'll have the following structure, right? V is a constant part plus fluctuation of a Higgs, okay? And this couples the, the left-handed component of given fermion A to its right-handed component, okay? B. And now from here, as you know very well, this is fermion mass matrix, okay? So fermion mass matrix AB Psi, this is G Psi AB V. And correspondingly, the coupling of the Higgs, G, we can rewrite as fermion mass matrix divided by the vacuum expectation value. So we have fermion mass matrix plus the coupling of the Higgs boson with fermions. And this coupling has the following form, is proportional to the mass of the fermion Okay, now what are we learning from here? So we are learning from here that the fermion mass sets the strength of the coupling of the Higgs boson to the fermions. So in other words, uh, fermions, psi psi, among the fermions, a Higgs 
particle mediates a, an interaction, okay? Um, in fact, this interaction is the potential mediated by, by, by this interaction is similar to Izukawa basically, okay? So the mass of the Higgs times R over R. So in other words, the, the Higgs mediates a new Kawa type force, but it's a force that is proportional to the fermion mass. So for example, if, I, if there is a, some particular fermion, the force is proportional to the mass of the fermion. Now notice this is similar, very similar to gravity. So it's like Higgs, if Higgs were massless, it would mediate a force among fermions. No, in particular, it would be best well defined among heavy fermions. Uh, very similar to Newtonian type force with effective Newton's constant, G, let me call it G of Higgs, which will, would be defined by one over V square, okay? So effective Newton's constant, Newton's constant, of Higgs, all right? So now this, this way of looking at the Higgs also makes it useful for later to understand the, the hierarchy problem. Because notice from here, right? That we notice that the, the, the gravitational force, gravity-like force, mediated by the Higgs, if you compare it to actual Newtonian coupling constant, okay? So the actual Newtonian coupling constant divided. So the actual Newtonian coupling constant, as we said, we can rewrite as Planck length square, or we can define a corresponding mass. We will elaborate on this mass, the Planck mass. Planck mass is approximately 10 to the 19 GV, okay? So V, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs for Higgs-like Higgs gravity plays the same role as Planck mass would play for ordinary gravity. So correspondingly, the ratio of the Newtonian gravity, Newtonian coupling constant, the strength of Newtonian coupling to the Higgs gravity coupling is the, the ratio of the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs to the Planck mass squared. And this is something like 10 to the, so this is 10 to the 19, 10 to the two. So 10 to the minus 34. So this already prepares a basis for one of the most important questions, puzzles of the standard model that motivates physics beyond the standard model. Okay, this, so this way of looking at it. Okay, so let me stop, stop here because it's already 12. Um, and uh, take questions if there are any. So the, if that, if the huge gap of Newtonian gravity and Higgs gravity like uh, something called the hierarchy problem, um, yeah, that's one way to that's one way to think about the hierarchy problem. Now, hierarchy problem I will explain in great details because gravity plays a very important role in understanding in in making problem real. So, gravity and in particular uh, black holes, uh, and th th those are very important for correctly posing the problem. We will discuss this in in great details. But this is already a sort of immediately gives you some preparatory basis because you see immediately that you, a standard model offers you a sort of gravity, okay? Of course, this gravity is very short range. The Higgs, the force mediated by the Higgs is a very short range force. Um, it's, it's sort of a gravity, but much stronger than Newtonian gravity. Now, this is a part of the puzzle. You can, so there is a part of the puzzle, but this is not the entire puzzle because the entire puzzle also has to do with sensitivity to ultraviolet physics, et cetera, et cetera. So this, but this is already sort of tells you something that if, for example, if Higgs were massless, 
imagine for a moment that Higgs were massless. Okay, so that's perfectly po a po perfect possibility in the standard model. In the standard model, Higgs mass is an independent parameter. It's independent of the masses of other particles. So imagine that the masses of all the other particles are as they are, except Higgs is massless. So what kind of universe that would be? So in that universe, we would have gravity mediated, Newtonian gravity mediated by Higgs exchange. 34 orders of magnitude stronger than normal Newtonian gravity. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's um, sort of um, a way to way, one way to to take take into account. Okay, this this fact. Thank you. So oh, I have a question. So yes, is please. it possible with this analogy to think about some sort of I don't know if this even makes sense. Sort some sort of Higgs black holes in some analogous way. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, those will not be exactly like black holes okay yeah sure. would be would be a, a sort of black hole type analogs of black holes um, as far as you can get to black holes in scalar gravity because of course higgs mediates gravity that is not real gravity because real gravity is mediated by a particle which carries spin two uh, so the only newtonian limit the Higgs gravity and ordinary gravity, they, they become similar, uh, okay? Only Newtonian limit, meaning for non-relativistic sources, Newtonian gravity becomes similar to, uh, Higgs gravity becomes similar to Newtonian gravity, but it's much stronger. So correspondingly, what would you call black, uh, Higgs uh, black holes, sort <laughs> of? Those would be much, much larger, okay? So for example, the same particle would grow since the same particle of the same mass, the Higgs gravity is much stronger than ordinary gravity at short distances. Strongly gravitating objects, which you can call sort of Higgs black holes versions of in, in Higgs gravity, um, yeah, they would be they would they, they, yeah you could you could have uh, you could, you could have you could define them as Higgs black holes. Again, they will not be ordinary black holes obviously because ordinary black holes require spin two structure. We'll discuss spin two structure. That's, that's important, but yes. So there will be strongly interacting objects. Yeah. And would this have an effect on the on the vacuum of the theory? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the the the. For example, if, assume for a moment. Assume, assume for a moment that let's let's Im let, let's imagine. Let let's give give uh, stretch our imagination. And let's imagine that the the Higgs mass is zero, okay? So what do we have in this kind of situation? So we have some, uh, let, let's consider only leptons if you want, I, I don't know, the electrons or, or whatever, fermions, okay? Massive stable fermions, suppose you have massive stable fermions. So we would have long range gravity like interaction for non-relativistic sources, literally Newtonian gravity for non-relativistic sources, but with the coupling constant, which is 34 orders of magnitude stronger than Newtonian coupling, okay? So, of course, the universe would, would be very different. The, 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 a lot of planets would, be, would, would not withstand such a strong attraction and so on and stars and so on. Of course, the story will change dramatically with this type of um, new contribution to gravity-like interaction. Um, so that's what would happen now. In the vacuum, yeah, vacuum is a vacuum. So in the vacuum, you would have uh, vacuum of the theory now would support yet another long range force, scalar long range force, okay? Of course, that is not happening in ordinary, in, in, in our universe because Higgs has a mass which is very high. So it's an extremely short range. Uh, Higgs gravity is extremely short range, but that's a, that's a technicality, okay? Of course, for us, it's a very important technicality because, uh, yeah, but um, yeah. Okay, I don't know. Does this answer your question? Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, Omar has a hand up. Okay, so my question is about, I would like to understand better the concept behind considering the Higgs like a perturbation um, from the vacuum, let's say. So this, this has puzzled me for some time because, for example, we are assigning the bed of the Higgs 
let's say, as you said, order 100 GB. But yeah. what does this mean? Because this sounds to me, maybe I'm wrong, but like if you, for example, go to 10,000 GB, since let's say that the masses of the fermions are proportional to this 100 GB value, mm -hmm. it, what happens to the masses? Do they become like effectively massless? If I go, for example, above this threshold, yeah. So let me try very to good. formulate yeah. it better. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's if, a very good question. Yes, absolutely. Because sometimes people confuse these two concepts. This is like extremely important. So, in other words, here's what's happening in the standard model. In the standard model, okay, we have sometimes we plot this as a as a as a potential as a Mexican head potential. Remember, right? Okay, you have seen this many times. Yes. So, and so this. Uh, an expectation value of the Higgs. Uh, let me, this is essentially a potential for rho, okay, rho. So actually it's only one, it's only half of this potential because rho is positive definite, okay? So this part is like rho of X, expectation value of rho. And so we are here, so this is V, okay? So in other words, let me write it for rho, therefore. Okay, so here is the so rho is positive definite, and so here is v of rho. Okay, and so we have some structure like this. All right, so this is v. So we are here, and fluctuations of the expectation value of rho, the the fluctuations, these are Higgs fluctuations of the Higgs field. Okay, so the 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 Higgs particle and Higgs field is a fluctuation of rho around the vacuum, okay, near the vacuum, small fluctuations of rho. Okay, now these particles, they are massive, okay, Higgs particle is massive because of self-interaction, because of this, and other particles, fermions, are also massive, right? As we said, fermion mass psi is given by the Yukawa coupling constant times the expectation value of the Higgs field. All right, so now your question is, this mass, comes from the vacuum. That's what you are saying, asking. Okay, so yeah. this comes from the yeah. vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. Now, what happens at high energies, okay? So for example, if I do collision of two fermions uh, through the Higgs boson or whatever, okay? Some contact interaction among fermions or interaction among fermions or, or a photon, etc. Do fermions become massless at high energies? And here we have to distinguish, it's extremely important to distinguish two different, completely different things. So first, if I'm considering a single particle, a few particle processes, in few particle processes, fermions would remain massive. It doesn't matter how, how large is the energy of the fermion. Fermion will remain massive. Of course, that goes without saying that the dispersion relation of a massive fermion is given by this expression. And this is a general phenomena universally. If, the, if, if momentum is much larger than the mass, okay, effectively, if fermion is ultra relativistic, effectively, the mass is less and less important. But this mass will never be zero. Okay, so fermion will remain a massive fermion, high energy, but massive fermion. Of course, if fermion mass is, is energy is very high, mass is less important in certain processes. Okay. However, there is an independent phenomena, which is not this, which has to do with the environment in the early universe. Now, it turns out that if we submerge the standard model in the environment in which we have high occupation number of particles, for example, in thermal bath, Okay, because the universe was thermal back in the back in the early universe. Okay, with with high temperature, so it turns out that in at high temperature, at high temperature, actually symmetry the order parameter vanishes. At very high temperature, the expectation value of the Higgs effectively vanishes. That's an independent phenomena. Okay, that requires environment with very high occupation number. This is environment this is temperature much larger than the weak, weak scale okay the temperature is much larger than weak scale effectively what sometimes people call symmetries can be restored 
okay? So then the expectation value of the Higgs field vanishes. And of course, fermion effectively becomes massless. Massless, but not, but has to face the environment because that's not a free vacuum. Now you have a, you have a very hot plasma and fermion will interact with these plasma particles. So there will be additional effects from there. But this is very important to distinguish these two effects. Without high occupation number state, if I do an experiment at high, with, with high energy experiment in fermions, they will remain massive. Nothing will happen to them, okay? So fermion, fermion scattering, fermion will be massive, high energy fermion, yeah. Okay, does this Perfect. answer your question? That, that was exactly what I was asking. So another question I have, a very brief one. What happens with higher spin fields, let's say? Why does it happen that above one um, spin one, you have this, uh, let's say, too many components to the field, more than actual degrees of freedom? Why does this happen? And the, the question is, does it happen for, let's say, three halves? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Half and so, so. Yes, for any, for any theory that we know, with our current understanding of theories of high spin, high spin, and as I said, as I said, more and more most rewrite theory, as, as a gauge with under the theory, under the theory. Yeah, at least you have a choice, okay? okay. But for theories with spin larger or equal to one, we don't have any other description. All the descriptions, including three halves, right? Three, spin three half, for example, is a famous example of three, spin three half is gravitino in supersymmetric theories. So those, including those spin three half, those are gauge redundant theories. The theory is always exhibit gauge redundancy. With higher spins, so what we are observing is the following, that higher you go into the spin, more restrictive is the theory, okay? For example, a standard model shows you that you can have more than one theory of spin one, okay? But it turns out that you cannot have more than one theory of massless spin two. Massless, the theory of massless spin two with no other degrees of freedom, uniquely is Einstein gravity. And then when you go above spin two, uh, the theory becomes super restrictive in such a way that actually theories with higher spin they all always come with infinite tower of spins. You can never have, for example, you cannot have interacting theory of spin five and nothing else. So these are always effective theories. Either it's a theory with a cutoff or a th full theory is a theory with infinite tower. Now, why is that the case? I don't know why is that the case? That's an uh, extremely good question. Uh, so and this goes back to the story, is, is gauge redundancy fundamental? Maybe because we are not smart enough to, to produce non-gauge redundant description of the theory, and maybe because of that, but, but, but that's the state of art. Mm -hmm. 